First of all, thank you so much for being here today. I know how busy all of you are and taking some time out of your busy schedule, either as a student, as a DVM student, as a PhD student, master's student, or as a faculty, as staff. I know how difficult it is to find time to be here today, so I'm very thankful to all of you. And I'm also extremely grateful to Dr. Baljit Singh, who also took some time, some, some time out of his busy schedule to be here today. Uh, he's Vice President of Research for the University of Saskatchewan, and I can only imagine how hectic his uh, schedule and his calendar must be. So having said all of that, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the Schofield Lecture and also tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Baljit Singh, who is one of our OVC alumni and a good friend of all, most of us here. I said most of us, most of us who've been here, who've been fortunate enough to be here for uh, two, two and a half, th uh, three decades or so to have had the opportunity to interact with Dr. Singh over the years. Uh, so just a brief overview of what the Schofield Lecture is all about. Uh, first of all, the Schofield uh, Memorial Lecture is dedicated to Dr. Frank uh, Schofield, an influential pioneer of veterinary medicine in Canada. Dr. Schofield emigrated from England as a teenager and entered OVC 1907. Soon after graduation, he traveled to Korea as a Canadian missionary to teach bacteriology. Due to his activities in the defense of the Korean people against Japanese occupation, he left Korea and returned to OVC in 1921, where he worked for 33 years. On retirement, he returned to Korea to work for the College of Veterinary Medicine in Seoul. Uh, in recognition of his distinguished services to Korea, Korea's independence, Dr. Schofield became the only foreigner to be buried at the National Patriot Cemetery in Korea. While Schofield had many significant contributions to veterinary research in the first half of the 20th century, undoubtedly the most important was his discovery of anti-thrombin substance in soy clover. Through his systematic investigation of hemorrhagic disease in cattle in 1922, Schofield made several astute observations that traced the disease to cattle fed uh, sweet clover. Uh, clover that had been spoiled by mold. His observations eventually led to uh, the development of anticoagulant drug warfarin. The Schofield Memorial Lecture celebrates Frank Schofield's life, his research, and his role as a motivational icon, and a proponent of meticulous scientific inquiry, who has undoubtedly inspired the many subsequent research achievements here at OVC. Dr. Schofield provides us with the incentive to achieve the high standards of effort, intellect, and ethics, to practice evidence-based medicine, and to strive towards translation of our scientific discoveries into effective advances in both human and animal health. And in just a few seconds, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Singh, and you're going to probably come to the same conclusion that we all have come, that he is one of the, um, I would say, brightest that we have in terms of veterinary research, veterinary teaching, and he has made significant contributions to both teaching in veterinary medicine and also research. Dr. Singh received his BDSC and master's degree from the Punjab Agricultural College in India before arriving in Canada to pursue his PhD here in OBC at the Department of Biomedical Sciences. He completed his PhD in 94 and moved to the US to complete two postdoctoral positions at Texas A&M University and then eventually at Columbia University. We were quite fortunate that we managed to recruit him to back to Canada uh, at the University of Saskatchewan at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in 98 and he began his independent academic career at the Western College of Vet Medicine in uh, their Department of Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Singh spent the next 18 years of his career at WCBM where he rose to the rank of professor and also he became ADR. So he would have been my ADR counterpart at, at the Western College of Medicine. He then moved to Calgary to be the second dean of University of Calgary Veterinary Medicine, UCBM. And uh, this was followed by uh, him being recruited back by the University of Saskatchewan to become their vice president of research in early 2021. Dr. Singh has been a source of inspiration and pride for OVC, and many of us, including myself, have interacted with him over the years, and we 
we never cease to be amazed at, as to how impactful and how wonderful it is to work with him. He has received numerous awards, including major international, national, or institutional teaching awards. And I can tell you that there is a long list of those awards. I'm just going to give you maybe two or three of them. Uh, he's received the Outstanding Veterinary Anatomist Award by the American Association of Veterinary Anatomists. He has received the Master Teacher Award by the University of Saskatchewan. And very importantly, he was appointed or elected as a 3M National Teaching Fellow in 2009. Dr. Singh has also been inducted to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and is currently a fellow of the American Association of Anatomists. If that wasn't enough for you, you should know that Dr. Singh also has an amazing track record of research and has published over 100 papers in high impact journals. He's held large research grants and he was just telling us that he's, he's just recently applied for NSERC Discovery. Just to tell you how motivated and how hard working Dr. Singh is in all aspects of his academic career. And this is all despite his high, very heavy administrative duties. To add to all of these, he has been an avid promoter and ambassador for One Health. And uh, he was the, the person who initiated one of the, I would say, most successful One Health programs educationally um, in, in Canada and around the globe. And this was supported by a large answer create. So, there is a lot more to talk about, but uh, for the, in the interest of time, I'm just going to pass this along to Dr. Singh, and he's going to entertain you for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Singh. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif, Shayan, and um, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm, uh, I'm so thankful. Uh, that I got a chance to be um, a student at the Ontario Veterinary College at University of Guelph. And uh, I, a day doesn't go by when I don't think back to the OBC and the opportunity that it provided uh, to me uh, 32 years ago. And uh, I'm eternally grateful uh, to this college, to this university, and in large measures, what few things I have been able to do in my life, as Dr. Sharif has spoken, they are outcome of what began at the OBC. And I am so thankful and honored to be asked to, given the, uh, to give the Schofield Lecture. And it's quite humbling. It's uh, to come back to the home where I began my journey as a, as a student, as a research trainee, to be asked to come back to give one of the most prestigious lectures in our country in veterinary medicine. It's very humbling. And uh, I really want to thank so many teachers, mentors, and friends from 1990 till today, whom I continue to consult, seek their advice, seek their mentorship, and who have supported me so deeply, so passionately um, throughout this, uh, this career. Um, so really, I wanted to say it very sincerely that I am very grateful uh, to this outstanding institution uh, that we have. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge the uh, First Nations uh, treaty lands or the unceded territories where we do our work, whether in Saskatchewan or here in Ontario. And we are all deeply engaged in the uh, reconciliation project of our country and it's of vital importance that our universities continue to remove barriers to create equal access to everyone for higher education because education is the one that opens doors, creates equality, creates a sense of justice in our society and I think OBC plays a major role in that aspect. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Other point is this has been a very difficult talk to put together and uh, um, what to say, uh, where to hook it and uh, what to tell uh, students and faculty members and uh, staff and others who are going to attend. So in preparation for that I spoke to Cheyenne and I listened to the talk that my uh, mentor Dr. Anne Croy gave Schofield lecture a few years ago. And I was able to, based on that, 
try to put a talk together. Uh, so I hope it will uh, tell some of the things I have been able to do. But I still, till today, I am puzzled of all the things that have happened in my career. Uh, I can't make sense of them. And I, um, I cannot make sense of them. I did a PhD, I can't make sense of them. I got a faculty position. I really don't understand why I became a dean or a vice president. So this has been a mystery for me and I still don't have an answer to that. And so that's why the title of the talk is, um, is, is, is towards that. It's normally said that we cannot change a little thing in a big uh, mass. On the outside it may look that nothing has changed but when we uh, 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 mess with a little molecule, little particle, it does change something in a very uh, big way. And that may be the reason and the starting point where the divergence takes place. The systems can go this way and the individuals can go that way. So I think in some ways when, you, when I look back on some of the things in my life, there have been these instances where something changed for me. Uh, I was not able to grasp it at that moment as to what the change is. I was not smart enough to see the opportunity there, but there were a set of circumstances that led to a different trajectory for me compared to where I was going. So I uh, grew up in a village in Punjab. Uh, this is Google Maps and uh, uh, this is the place where, uh, where my village is. Uh, we can see it and then there is a canal which runs next to it and then there is a village further away where I would go to study for my high school riding a bicycle along with a bunch of other people. It's a typical agricultural zone where uh, uh, crops are grown, animals are raised and that is the environment in which I, I grew up. And there in the high school uh, was a teacher, you see his picture on the screen. And this particular teacher was very different compared to everybody else in the school. The normal system was that a teacher would come, dictate you something for history, political science or biology. Then in the final exam, you write exactly that back on the examination sheet and you get your mark. He would do experiments. If we needed to see how many colors light is made up of, he's going to take a prism and show it. Refraction, reflection, everything else has to be done through an experiment. It was quite an uh, anxiety creating experience for the whole class because we had no notebooks what we were going to write in the final exam. I do not know what happened to the rest of the class but I took to that way of learning in a, in a very deep manner. I said you need to experience life and we need to do experiments to understand the environment in which we are uh, present. I think that was the first grain that shifted for me many many years ago in the in the high school. At the same time after after finishing that piece I ended up going to a Punjab Agricultural University which was one of the first two land grant universities set up in in India. This is the university that led the development of green revolution in India from the late 60s to the 70s to early 80s. When the high yielding varieties were introduced, intensive agriculture came into play, but of course it has to have consequences. One of the positive consequences was the farming income went up and that allowed families to send their kids like me to universities, to colleges, and hundreds and thousands of young men and women were able to get degrees from the university but then there were not jobs for many of them at the end of the day and that leads to unrest within the society. The other piece as Alexander von Humboldt says in the great chain of causes and effects we cannot take a single fact in isolation. In a similar way when you are growing crops in a very intensive way the amount of fertilizer you use and the amount of the pesticides we put in there, it's going to cause contamination. Simultaneously, in the area where I grew up, you could dig water at 10 feet below the ground. Now it's at 200 feet below the ground. So growing crops leads to water depletion and the contamination of the environment, which has downstream health effects and the water security issues. And water is fundamental to life and then we don't know what's going to happen in the coming years. So again the interconnectedness of the pieces when we deal with a single element 
uh, it, it is going to create some effects which we cannot predict which are going to be not measured very quickly which may lead to very divergent outcomes at the end of the day but this was a university where um, I had a great time um, I, I studied uh, I, um, I participated in drama and dance in student politics it was a modern university it was not there was nothing like this in the state where we got a chance to uh, go to school to the veterinary uh, college so this is what happened to me in the first year <laughs> so all the things dr sharif has said now you are going to put it in context i got an f grade in anatomy and this is the third term of the first year of five credit course and i failed it and that was quite an eye opener and how do you go from that to this if this is in my life i imagine it is this is nothing short of a miracle to fail your anatomy in the first year then few years decades later you end up doing some work on a book which has been written by three giants in veterinary anatomy dissect and vincent this is the that part of the journey uh, that uh, that we can talk about how does it happen so even to the extent where maclean's magazine labeled me as a bungler as an academic bungler in 2009 and so this is a bit of a story about uh, about that piece and before i go there i want to tell you about the picture of the dog at the front cover of the book that's boomerang it's my dog we took him 10 years ago and we proudly brought him home enrolled in in, in the obedience class and he passed but he did not really pass he was the second from the bottom of the pack of the dogs and the reason he was second from the bottom because one dog did not finish the exam <laughs> so he was right like at the that at the end of the game but it really doesn't the there he there he's looking excitingly uh, uh, out at the screen and then the problem is he got 91 out of 100 and this is grade inflation to the extreme and from that point onward boomerang has never learned a new command he continue to find embarrassing a new ways to embarrass me in public and to an extent where i don't even tell people in public that i am a veterinarian who has a pet <laughs> but to talk of telling somebody i'm a dean or was a dean of a college so boomerang is this happy dog his picture is on the title cover and uh, he is a good boy 10 years old um, but uh, obedient he is not <laughs> and So when you look at uh, after finishing that uh, degree I went and worked for a year and a half came back to the university to pursue um, a graduate program and I was given a project to look into trypanosoma avensi and uh, did an epidemiology study this was an eye opener that how do we imagine something to be in the real world and how it does not pan out the general assumption was that this particular infection is very prevalent in the field when i did the survey for 11 months i could not find anything literally other than couple of positive cases and my supervisor kept on reassuring me that at the end of the day you observe you describe you explain that's your job not to say you found something positive or negative but it did not i thought what would i tell the audience when i present my thesis seminar that i had zero and zero and zero and zero cases but it forced me to think deeply as to what might have happened leading to reduction in the incidence of infection in the state of punjab it was a very simple experiment done in very demanding circumstances not without not with much of uh, scientific support so what we did was that because of intensive agriculture all the wetlands have been cleared where the vector would breed and the camel which is a reservoir of this infection is not being used in agriculture practice anymore because uh, the tractors are being used or that led to a massive decline in the infection of this disease and gave a brand new data to the veterinarians in the state that this particular infection is not as common as everybody was thinking till that point because nobody was diagnosing the disease but everybody was treating the disease thinking that it's very prevalent so when we do research 
our observation has to be very astute, then we have to be able to describe it, then we really need to be able to explain it. This was the first major experiment as Dr. Larry Smith, the dean in Saskatoon, was talking about Dr. Schofield that he liked to work in austerity. He was able to do things when he did not have many material things with him to, to, to work through. I think in a way while working in Punjab I could relate to that, uh, that that was the environment in which the research was being done there. Now how did I end up in Guelph? You all possibly thinking that I applied for PhD program and I got accepted here and I came. But that's not how it happened. After my master's degree, I got some money and I got a visa to travel to Germany, to US and then to Canada. It was a tourist um, a visa and I landed in Germany on the day the Berlin Wall came down. It was quite a remarkable to be in that country when the wall came down on 7th of November 1989. And to see the Germans celebrating, finally the families getting reunified, it was quite an amazing scene. From there, I moved to, uh, to US for a few weeks and traveled there, then ended up in Canada. I really wanted to see Ontario Veterinary College because in India, we knew about this college as one of the premier institution for learning for veterinary medicine. One of my former teachers, he was doing a DVSC in anesthesiology with Dr. Wayne McDonnell. I stayed with him for one night and there I met Professor Atwal. He has passed away now. There at the dinner, he asked me, uh, what did you do? I said, I finished an MSc. I have been appointed as an assistant professor back at the university in Punjab. He said, would you like to do a PhD? I said, yeah, in four or five years, I will get a study leave and then I will do the PhD. He said, why don't you do it right now with me? I said, I have not even applied. He said, well, we can do it. So that is it. I'm standing there about to go back to India a week later. And there is a professor who offered me a PhD spot at this university, at this college, without even thinking. And that the second grain which shifted in my life. And suddenly, um, going back, teaching, waiting five years, then doing a PhD, here I am. And I, Dr. David Porter, who was the head of the chair of the biomedical science, he wrote a letter to waive off the English language exam. I went over to Chicago to Canadian Embassy, got my visa changed. I was here in May 1990, taking the first lecture given by Dr. Anne Croy in the cell structure and function class. It's amazing how that happened. So, that began my journey in this country thanks to Professor Atwal and I became a graduate student at this place. So, that began my journey through snow and uh, uh, sexy abs as they call it. And, but that is the talk of the second talk, when uh, title of the second talk, when you invite me again. So that's more exciting and entertaining. We won't uh, do that today. Then how did I come to teach anatomy? I wanted to be involved in teaching at this college, but I could not find a way. I went to pathobiology and asked if I could be a teaching assistant in parastology, but I couldn't get a foothold there. So then somebody said, go talk to um, Dr. Summerlee. I went and spoke to him. He said, sure, uh, you could be my teaching assistant. And so then began a journey with an F grade in anatomy, not any deep passion for teaching anatomy. And, but it was one of those opportunities. I said, I'm not going to let go off. Then I worked with Dr. Anne Croy, with Dr. Atwal, very sporting, three mentors, and I will spend nights dissecting specimens, trying to memorize the materials so that I could be of some help to the students next day in the class, and mostly I will forget most of the stuff. Then I had reasonably thick accent, I'm sure, at that point, and then it was just challenges all over the way. But what happens in that environment is, that when you are passionate about something, there's enthusiasm, you are working hard, people will sort of gather around you. So I was working with a class of 95, people like Tom Gibson, Madonna Gamus, and uh, many others. They were very supportive. 
they would encourage me, they will inspire me, they will try to help me um, as to how to describe something to a student. And then class of 96, you see Dr. Joanne Hewson here, and then Scott Wees and uh, uh, Sharon McCann, my an another friend, and Craig Mosley, lots of people in this class, and class of 97, uh, Tony is there. And uh, it was remarkable how these students became my friends, my coaches, my mentors in many ways to help me grow as a teacher. To the extent where the class of 96 elected me as their honorary class president, what I took away from that was, it was a big learning experience, that what students are willing uh, to do is to help the teacher immensely how to teach well. So my feedback mechanism throughout my career has been ask the students what is working and really go back to them to tell that I'm trying to correct the things which did not work well last year. Every year when I begin teaching, I will tell the class, this is what I was doing last year, this is the feedback I got, and that's the changes I'm making in the class today. So that feedback creates a trust with the class. The debates about didactic and problem-based learning, one system or the other, they will come and go. The fundamental process of engagement with the students, that is the key. That's built on trust, communication, a passion for delivering that piece of knowledge in an easy to understandable uh, manner. I will come to trust in a minute as to how critical that piece is because my teachers always trusted me. Alastair Summerly would trust me and Croy would say, no, no, you go and explain this to students. We used to do radiographs for the first year class. I will learn from her, then I will explain to the students. Dr. Croy will give me feedback as to what worked well or not. That's how it all happened in the anatomy lab at the Ontario Veterinary College. And Dr. Schofield, think about the 20s, he was talking about the instruction which really stimulates the mind. So teaching does not change. We try to reinvent the system every few years, but it doesn't really change much. Think about 1920s. We were still talking about the same thing, how to engage the student and how to create a learning for them. While at Guelph, the EDI, which is very common these days, I was deeply involved in the student government and I was involved in the campus politics and during that period, this campus was alive on how to create a system which is equitable, which is full of justice. University of Guelph has been at the forefront of those types of discussions. There was a committee put together, I was put on the committee. For me, mostly it was a learning experience to talk about issues of equity, diversity and inclusion in the early 90s. Working with a bunch of outstanding students, Leon Hall, Natalie Junglai, Leanne Simpson, who is a leading singer, songwriter and an author, um, indigenous uh, uh, person, is, I did work with all of them. And that report which was given to President Mordecai Ruzanski led to the creation of a human rights office at the University of Guelph and that really continued to flourish in the years since then. So really being involved in the community is what is the key uh, for, uh, uh, for me. That's where I learn a lot, that's where I get to contribute whatever I can. So Guelph was really this crucible of experience for me, uh, then I was able to go into the world and do other things. Now, you might say, did I do any research ever? I did. But before I go there, I want to talk about Dr. Frank Schofield. See, he was passionate about equality in the 50s, 40s, and after that. He was the first one to get a black woman appointed on this campus to break the color barrier. He went to South Korea to help people there. He helped the veterinarians who were displaced by the war in Europe. I think this is what OVC does. I think we need to double up the effort as a veterinary community to remove the barriers that withhold, hold back racialized uh, veterinarians or indigenous veterinarians really create a very open opportunity for everyone because this is what Dr. Schofield would have done uh, if he were still around today. So. Here I fell, uh, did a project on pulmonary intravascular macrophages. I continue to work on this cell 
it was quite a cumbersome cell to work with. You could not see it with light microscope. I had to do electron microscope. And what I was working with was this little material shown by the red arrowheads, these globules on the surface. If somebody would ask me what are you working on, it was very difficult to explain. So what I would do is carry an electron micrograph in my lab coat pocket. If somebody says what you do, I will take it out and begin to describe it. That became quite an exercise and I became good at describing the research that I do and developing an elevator pitch for the research project that I was doing. This work has kept me occupied uh, for many years uh, till today. Uh, this is a very unique cell, it promotes lung disease. When you remove these cells from the lung, uh, the lung inflammation goes down. Uh, and today we were discussing an hour ago about uh, the, the role of this particular cell in, uh, in domestic animal species. From here, I, as I, Dr. Sharif said, I went to do a postdoc and then I ended up back in, in, in Saskatoon as a, as a faculty member. Thinking about trust, these are my two first undergraduate summer students. There is a story there in what they are trying to do. Nigel Rawlings and Jackie Pierce. I asked Nigel that we have an incubator in the lab, we have to replace the glass door to it. We purchased one. I said, Nigel, can you fix it up? He went there, he came back an hour later, he said, maybe I screwed it too tight, it cracked. I said, well, it happens, let's order an another one. And we did that, and I said to Nigel, go and put it back on. An hour later, the technician comes, he said, Nigel has cracked the door, he has gone home, and he is not coming back. <laughs> I said, well, that's a problem. I said, you order the third door, and you call Nigel, that he is the only one who is going to fix the door. Nobody else is going to do that, because he needs to build confidence. He was a first year undergraduate summer student. So Nigel comes back, we get the third door, Nigel screws it back, it worked fine. So building that confidence, Nigel never looked back. He published a series of papers as an undergraduate student along with Jackie Pierce, who showed for the first time as a first year veterinary student that if you deplete intravascular macrophages, the lung disease caused by Mannheimia hemolytica really goes down. One of the very foundational paper on depletion of the PIMS from the lungs and to show that. So that tells you that the undergraduate students with fresh mind, with fresh eyes, given the opportunity to think in a trusting manner, they will come back with very brilliant ideas. So these are two, three papers which they published together and uh, uh, fixed the door to the incubator. Then the story about the PIMS continued. I got another very brilliant student from Israel, Karina Hronson. She said, we have been running these experimental models to show what PIMS do. We need to do a spontaneous disease model. If these cells are really that effective, we need to find out their function in a spontaneous disease. I said, well, you go ahead and do that. She said, let's pick up heaves, which is a neutrophilic disease. It happens in horses. It's very debilitating for them. Many horses lose their athletic careers. Let's do it, test it out in that. So she designed a very strong randomized crossover study where every horse was its own control. In between there was a washout period. And to show what she found was uh, clinical scoring. In the red box you see the difference between the horses which are exposed to moldy hay and versus the horses in which PIMS have been depleted. Look at the clinical signs go down very significantly. This was a blind study and the clinical signs of the heaves when the PIMS are depleted were really diminished. Then she took the bronchoalveolar lavage to look at the neutrophilic uh, concentration in the lavage. You look on the left side, there is moldy hay horses suffering from heave episode and there is neutrophils. On the right side is the lavage from the horses there that have been given a chemical to deplete their macrophages. You see macrophages uh, uh, in the lavage which is very typical. So there you go. So when you remove these cells from the lungs of the horses, you can even bring down the clinical signs of a spontaneous disease like heaves. So that was 
really uh, uh, then she did more work on toll like receptor fours the mechanisms through which it happens but i am not going to show that uh, right now then we made a serendipitous finding very recently by Stacy Anderson. She already is a dean of a veterinary school in the States, where she was looking at ischemia reperfusion, a systemic story in the horses, which is very common, uh, which can result in the loss of the life of the horse. She depleted those macrophages from the capillaries, and she wanted to see what happens to the clinical signs. It did not change much of the clinical picture, but the serendipitous finding was that the neutrophils uh, lifespan was significantly reduced. In inflammatory condition, neutrophils live longer, they produce lots of reactive oxygen species and that causes tissue damage. So by removing the macrophages from the lung capillaries, somehow that lifespan extension of the neutrophils was reversed and that possibly results in some therapeutic effect which we don't know what it means but it's a very interesting systemic physiological effect of removing a macrophage and looking into the into the cells so this story about the pims continues uh, in my lab uh, even today that began in uh, in this college then the question always has been where do these cells come from and do species like rats and mice and dogs and cats they don't have pims do they recruit them at some point. We showed few years ago that there is a possibility if you inject E. coli bacteria into the peritoneum of a rat, there might be more monocytes that come into, into, the, um, in, into, the, into the lungs. So here is a dog um, uh, experiment. We took the lung samples from dogs that have died because of pancreatitis. And you look on to the, um, uh, to the, to the right side there are a large number of macrophages onto the left side but the normal dog lung does not have pins. So this again is a spontaneous disease in an animal that does not have these cells but it gets recruited when there is a systemic disease. Doing the electron microscopy you see large number of macrophages in the lung again and you do rigorous morphometric quantification you see the macrophage numbers going up. So this is quite groundbreaking that if the dogs and the cats, if they have a systemic disease, they recruit large number of macrophages in the lungs, what happens when they get hit by endotoxin at some point? Do they get lung disease similar to the horse and the cows, which have pims? So we continue to follow up this, uh, this particular uh, story. And the last one on this piece is uh, looking into um, why do monocytes come into the lung? In the rat model, the monocyte chemotactic protein 1 goes up when you give pancreatitic treatment to the, to the mice. But when you use a knockout animal, the number of monocytes that get recruited into the lung, it does not go up. So the monocyte uh, chemotactic protein 1 seems to play a major role uh, when it comes to recruitment of the uh, pulmonary intravascular macrophages. So that's the story sort of coming together after, after all these years. This is my family, my wife and my son. Uh, my son is now finished high school this summer and uh, a few years ago we were traveling somewhere, that's a photo. Uh, so that we were talking about the family today, Joanne and I. This is what makes life at the end of the day. You finish your work, you go home, uh, that balance uh, about uh, your friends, your family, which has been the key in my life to be able to do few things that I have done because of the support from Sarbjit, my wife and my son Pahul, who is an avid Rubik cube solver. So he competes in that. His time for 3 by 3 Rubik cube is about 7 seconds. He can, he can solve it in, in that period. So a good kid, uh, very proud of him. On to the next story, another grain shifts. So few years later, a student comes, um, he says, you know, um, I finished an MSc in Ottawa, I published 12 papers, I want to do a PhD, I'm visiting UBC, Alberta, Toronto, I'm looking for a supervisor. I meet with him, I said, he's not going to come and work with me, I'm nobody. And I drive him to the airport and I say him goodbye. 
few days later he calls me back he said he's going to come work with me he comes i said why me he said because you have style you have a bronco with a red burgundy seat covers <laughs> i i said are you not worried about your phd project he said no nah, that will take care of itself so he comes and because of that car i got a bright undergraduate student who began a totally new program in my uh, laboratory on the nanotubes so these nanotubes are very interesting particles you can attach peptides to them drugs to them and you can put them into the animals to target to certain cells and the nano based molecules and the drug discovery platforms are coming in a big way and shane was the one who began that all in my lab so my trust with the student that they can think about their projects they can do the science on their own my job is to support them have discussion with them provide the resources and let them run with what they do this has been the story of my career whether teaching anatomy whether doing research i literally cannot take much credit for what has uh, been done in my lab i gave you example of nigel uh, jackie shane and before that karina hronson so that is the teaching mentorship philosophy i have always brought to the table uh, working that way then uh, we use those nanotubes to target cancer cells we were able to show that if you take the nanotubes and attach three amino acid sequence to them and you expose the adenocarcinoma cells to those particular tubes you will cause apoptosis in them through a signaling pathway that activates through map kinase leading to up regulation of caspase 3 and uh, the death of the cells it was quite a serendipitous finding because we were not treating cancer cells we were simply looking at how those cells will handle the nanoparticles but we found was they were dying through apoptosis so again we are pursuing this piece whether we can cause similar death of the cancer cells in a melanoma model uh, in a in a mouse uh, system and last piece of the grain shifting again you see that where i began where i ended up it was not part of any planned uh, exercise it was accidental it was serendipitous it just kept on changing course uh, at one point or the other i came out of an experimental biology meeting in orlando i'm going to my hotel after giving a talk i i look at a building i said what an ugly building i stood there for 2 3 4 5 minutes a person walked by then he came back he said did you give a talk this morning i said yes he said i wanted to ask you a question but the time ran out he asked me a question then he said what are you looking at i was looking at that ugly building and then he said oh yeah it's a really ugly building then he walked away we did not even exchange our names and then few weeks later we got in touch uh, with each other and he invited me to visit his lab he was professor pabist a world renowned immunologist human anatomist head of an institute in hanover germany and 2002 i went to his lab if i were not standing there for those 2 minutes i would have gone to my hotel and so again i have done quite a bit of work in germany done lots of research there in the many years it has added to my career my growth my uh, uh, professional growth and personal um, uh, growth but again did i plan it i didn't i just stopped there for a moment and this person happened to go by possibly because i wear a turban he recognized me he asked me a question we went away and that's it so how much of our life is built around these serendipitous accidental things which at that moment we don't recognize how much of that grain you take out of a sand dune which changes something in a very immeasurable way and only later on in life we realize that changed quite often some people say i was there i grabbed the opportunity i cannot say that in my case that i grabbed the opportunity other than the fact when professor atwal said do a phd i said ah oh, yeah why not do a phd right so i stayed other than that teaching anatomy working with dr croy dr summerly and others it was just mere accidents and look where it takes us in in life so the question is as we say is it a clockwork universe is there no place for unpredictability is it all going to tick along whether we do certain things plan in certain ways or not 
or is it going to be the butterfly flapping wings somewhere in South America and the storms are going to happen in Texas or something will change in a in a small way and it will change in a measurable way immeasurable way or is there an astrologer who is going to say something so I, I don't have an answer to that but in 2000 in 1989 in the summer a friend of mine said here is a guy an astrologer who forecasts things I have never I don't believe in them I never believed before till now now I don't do it as well so I went to this guy so he drew a chart he asked my date of birth place of birth time of birth he said it must be August 89 he said you are leaving this country in four months time I said I don't have a visa where am I going he said I don't know maybe you will go to Nepal where Indians don't need a visa to go but you have to go somewhere I thought well, maybe I will go so I finished my MBSc in October and I ran into him in late October he said you are still here I said well where am I supposed to go he said well you're supposed to go somewhere by November 10th as for your chart tells and on uh, October 31st or November 1st I got a visa for to, to US then I went over to German embassy got German visa then I got Canadian visa and I boarded a plane on November 6th now you might say well he told me that I'm going somewhere and I began to plan to go somewhere right it can happen but he also said something he said look in the next six eight months uh, you are going to get into a health problem you are going to get something abdominal you need to do this sort of ritual uh, it then it won't happen I said no he is really pushing his luck here but well, I'm not going to follow that mumbo jumbo I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a veterinarian I'm an evidence-based guy so I didn't do that eight months later I'm lying down in Mississauga general with an appendectomy <laughs> with a thirteen thousand dollar bill and I'm thinking about the astrologer now what is it clockwork butterfly flapping the wings or the predictions of the astrologers you figure it out these are some of the books I read I have read I read lots of books but these are some which I really uh, like uh, biography of Alexander von Humboldt uh, leadership book English patient by Michael Ondaatje, the war that ended peace there are many others I can talk about but I thought I should put some of those up there thank you very much and I'm happy to have discussion with you. This was one of the most difficult talk to put together. Didn't know what to talk, but really that's what has brought me up to this point. Um, mostly I think what the astrologer said, and, uh, but many other things. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. That was just fantastic, Dr. Singh. And I think, you know, this is a good um, testament to why you've received, you know, probably two dozen teaching awards. I think it was captivating. It was really inspirational for all of us, irrespective of where we are. As a, as a young scientist okay. or as a professor emeritus, I think, you know, it really influenced all of us and impacted all of us really in, deeply. So having said that, I know that we've got lots of uh, Lots of other activities involved in this process, including having a reception in the OVC cafeteria. But before we go to OVC cafeteria, I would like to call upon uh, Vice President for Central Veterinary Student Association. So Megan, if you would like to come over here and present Dr. Singh the medal, the Schofield Medal. Wow, I get a medal? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Yeah. It's got your name on the back of it. Yeah. There you go. Wow. I feel very touched and emotional with this one. Thank you. Thank wow. you so much, Megan. Uh, so the forum is open for any questions that you might have for Dr. Okay. Singh. Anything scientific or otherwise. Janet, yes. in the back. And I'm yeah. going to have to... It's got the bottom line on there, which is your favorite with RA? So, Dr. Singh, the question <laughs> is, which one is the favorite? Uh... Little drummer girl. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, 
So I hope those uh, online could hear the question and the answer. Yeah. At least I'm sure that they have yeah. heard the answer. And many of the constant gardener is another one very good. So, what do you think? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Saeed. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Like the last, is like the last, uh, is one of the last slides that you showed, and you mentioned the butterfly effect. Like as a, so actually in mathematics, like the chaos looks like a butterfly. Right. Auto, like it's a, like that's kind of reminded me of that, that we have the butterfly. As a chaos, yeah, yeah. Chaos is good sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Controlled chaos is good, yeah. It's interesting. If you wouldn't mind, maybe repeating the comment or, yeah. or, or question. It wasn't really a question. It was more. It's a more comment. of a comment. The comment was about the butterfly in mathematics is a, is a chaos type of story, right? And so, so that we do. So, Sarah, what do you think? This is what you were hoping for. Yeah. 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 I really liked how you talked about showing the changes that you made in response to student feedback. Right, right. And that's really what helped to build trust. Right. And I, found, I wrote that down in both. That okay. was really helpful. There were some veterinary students there. They were, any questions? <laughs> okay. Great. John. If you had to comment on, if you had to comment on, based on the things that you said, like a combination of serendipity, but if the astrologer was right, you'd forecast what you're going to do. So how do you find balance between those two things? And if you had to do it all again, would you do things differently? Or do you think that your way of walking through this journey led to enough good things that you would have confidence? I would not do it differently, John. So the question is, would I do things differently uh, if I have to relive my life? Uh, no, I would not. Uh, there have been challenges in life. Uh, uh, failing uh, courses and uh, uh, then uh, 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 really um, overcoming those challenges in life and uh, finding ways, uh, developing resiliency um, and just uh, uh, know I would not change a bit. Um, it, I will continue in the same path. Um, maybe I will become a little bit more organized uh, but uh, other than that, uh, no. Um, it has been a very good uh, 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 a journey full of lots of learning. Um, again, learning comes in many ways. In 2016, I was cleaning my office to move to Calgary. And when I was, I, typically if you come to my office, you won't see much paper there. But I still have paper. But I generally figure out which paper to keep. And there was a paper that Dr. Alan King gave to us in 1990. Dr. Alan King and Dr. David Porter will teach a course on how to write an abstract, how to criticize, critique a paper and there was his handout that he gave me. I made a photo and I sent it to him. He couldn't believe it that I had carried it from 1990 till 2016. I still have it because I use it to teach my students. Some things about teaching never change. The fundamental engagement of the student with the teacher is what makes it all, the rest, rest is all noise. And uh, it's um, that engagement is the key. So those, I'm a big on learning from people. And I could give you example. To me, when I, uh, again, I don't want to keep on bringing names here. When I was a graduate student, uh, Dr. Lamar came back to give a seminar for a faculty position, he came back. I mean, it was exciting to listen to what he was doing, how he gave his presentation about scientific data in those days. And so learning from the little piece everywhere, you keep on adding to your inventory, it will take some place. So this anatomy book, I haven't even told you story how it came to me, how I literally could not believe. Uh, sometimes we don't see ourselves growing uh, till other people see us growing. When the publisher called me, they said, we want you to take this book over. I said, why me? They said, because Dr. Dela Junta from uh, Howie Evans and Della Junta from Cornell both have said that this book needs to go to him now. I said, oh gosh, I failed anatomy. They said, get over it. That was a long time ago. Uh, you you need, to, uh, need to pick up this book. This is yours. You need to revise it, bring it up to speed. Uh, the two luminaries in anatomy have spoken. So 
I really thought deeply and I could not believe I didn't have, I thought, can I even do that? I have a doubt, insecurity about taking that book on. Uh, what, what happens if I mess it up? And uh, so, uh, so it took me three years to create the edition that came out in 2017. So we live with these challenges, but these, oppor these are opportunities to grow. I spoke to a uh, call Dr. Evans, I said, uh, really, I should, do you think I should, why should I? He said, Baljeet, I have seen you for 20 years. Uh, this is your book. You need to take it on. I have spoken and there's nobody else that, that needs to take it on. So your mentors will continue to carry you through, right? So find those uh, networks and supports uh, which, will, uh, which will carry us, uh, us through. So that's uh, my journey. I know some people, I can tell you, who were extremely bright. They planned their life, like Shane. Shane said when he was in high school, he knew he was going to do a BSc and MSc and PhD and then MD, then become a professor in a medical school. That's exactly what he did. He's a professor at University of Toronto. So, uh, so some people like me don't have that. Either it is that I'm not good enough. Um, I never uh, thought I would become even a professor. So, so it's a, I believe in, uh, in that piece where people will help you if you have the right piece in play. And, uh, uh, but teachers make us, yeah, good ones. I had many of them. Any other question from students? Ah, there you go. Oh, Nitesh, please go ahead. Uh, since uh, you're learning and teaching in Canada about One Health, what is your One Health objective in Canada and what you think is your health? One Health is uh, in a quite an interesting space. We spoke today, Dr. Sharif, and then Dr. Uh, Malcolm Campbell today. Um, so One Health is a very inherently collaborative piece. So unless the universities come together to present a compelling One Health vision to the government of Canada, we are not going to be successful at that. The problem is every university is trying to tell the government, I will do One Health for you. But that's not how One Health works. One Health needs to have multiple stakeholders, multiple universities, uh, and then you go and do it. So I think we are trying to build a coalition between Calgary, Montreal, Guelph, and Saskatchewan to talk to the government of Canada, to put some funding mechanism in place and then go from there. In Canadian context, I think we are very well placed. We can apply the principle of One Health to two things. Number one, the zoonosis and the biosecurity piece. And second one is the food production systems, uh, One Health concept over there. And then third piece could be the, our north in the Arctic, looking into the indigenous communities, social humanities piece, and the food production, energy transition, animal human health, we can put it over there as well. These are the three jurisdictions where I believe the One Health in Canada could be really impactful in, um, in advancing us. But it requires collaboration between the universities. I think we are making good progress at this point, largely because Dr. Sharif and I, we need to know each other personally, easy to work together. Uh, so we are pulling that coalition together now. In the One Health program that I ran, we had students from 19 countries at one time, uh, from Brazil to Rwanda to South Africa to Thailand to India to Norway. And all those graduates, many of them, are really leading One Health initiatives in their respective countries. The One Health leader in Germany, Dr. Kim Grutzmacher, is a graduate of that program. The One Health leaders in India, they are graduates of that program. So really, the key is to educate. Those are the leaders that will go solve problems, not Dr. Sharif and I. Our job is to create that opportunity for students to do interdisciplinary learning and then go on do the great stuff that they will do. Sukanda. So Sukanda, perhaps you know, this is going to be our last question, so please go on. Okay. I, I'm just asking, like, what do you think are the challenges in bringing uh, all the institutions or the federal government and the industries together where we can apply our one health? What are the challenges to bring all the entities together? It is, it is as bringing people together is challenging. Everybody has their own missions, their budgets, the provinces, the governments, silos, boundaries. It is just the nature of the, uh, the way we live our lives. And then we always want to take the bigger piece of pie to our own university. That always is at the back of the mind. 
So it is uh, just human behavior. And uh, somebody needs to step up, say, well, I don't need anything out of it, but we need to play together. That piece. Canadians generally do good, good job at that. We are not that bad when it comes to collaboration. And uh, there are many shining examples of working together. So again, uh, thank you so very much. I'm grateful, uh, Cheyenne, for this opportunity and this college and all of you. Um, thank you so very much. I'm very grateful to this college. <laughs>